is a very interesting conversation that I'm so glad that I've had the opportunity to have because it answers a lot of questions that I've had about the Controlled Substances Act, but also provides the granular details of exactly what happened in this legal battle that we have been waging since January of this year. And I've looked on social media and seen what people are writing about it. People saying, well, that's not really a victory because the DEA withdrew or it doesn't even make a difference because the Federal Analog Act still exists and things like that. So I want to address some of these different impressions that I've encountered and contextualize what was going on, why it was important, and why any of this mattered to me. So for anyone listening to this who's followed my work for a while, I'm often asked some variation of a question like, what is your favorite drug or what is the most interesting drug in the world to you? And I always say, oh, I don't know, you know, I, I can't answer. It's like, what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite song? You can't answer that question. but the answer was DIPT. I didn't ever say DIPT because I was afraid that if I drew any attention to it, that I would raise its profile in some way and the result would be DIPT being prohibited. And the reason that I cared about DIPT so much was not because it's my favorite drug in the sense that I uh, enjoy it recreationally. The reason is that I've spent about 13 years studying DIPT with Jason, and none of this research has been published. This has been an extremely labor-intensive, ongoing labor of love that we have done with no external funding for countless hours. And I always felt that as horrible as the DEA can be and often is, that this was just not something they were ever going to prohibit. It's simply wasn't a substance that anybody used with any degree of frequency. I mean, even in the realm of research chemicals, which already represent some minuscule slice of the larger pie of drug abuse issues in the United States, even the most popular research chemicals like methoxetamine or mephedrone still are incredibly obscure compared to something like methamphetamine or heroin or alcohol or tobacco. I mean, these are substances that essentially have no tangible effect on public health in the United States. So if those aren't an issue, what is DIPT? It is beyond not an issue. It is nothing. So when the Federal Register published a notice on January 14th of this year that DIPT was going to be placed in Schedule 1, it was utterly shocking. It was utterly horrifying for me. And Jason and I immediately started scrambling to figure out what we could do. And you could say, well, you guys are researchers working at a university. You'll, you can just get a Schedule One license. What difference does it make if you're doing bona fide research? Well, the reality is that contemporary scientific research relies on collaboration with different labs and contract research organizations. And for example, if somebody wanted to have a DIPT derivative labeled with a radioactive atom for certain types of experiments, the CRO that would do the radio labeling almost certainly would not have a license to work with Schedule 1 DIPT, and it would dramatically increase the cost of that synthesis. That's just one example, but it really interferes with collaboration, which is foundational to current scientific research. It makes everything bureaucratic and difficult. I mean, even working with ketamine in Jason's lab is a huge hassle. It has to be kept in a safe. The door to the lab that has the safe has to be closed all the time. Jason has to keep a logbook of every milligram that is moved in and out of the safe. It's a hassle. And scientific research is difficult enough without this kind of stupidity interfering with it. So, Jason and I started trying to figure out what it was that we could do. I contacted everyone I knew that might have some insight into the appropriate course of action. I asked Rick Doblin. He started talking about what he did when MDMA was going to be controlled. And he really tried, but as we all know, 
the efforts of Rick Doblin and Alexander Shulgin in the 1980s were not successful. I contacted Ethan Nadelman, former head of the Drug Policy Alliance. He didn't know what to do. I contacted Holly Whitson, the lawyer who was friends with Ken Nelson in the Toad episode, who was just a very helpful, legally wise person. She gave some advice on how to file for a hearing, but in terms of a defense strategy, it really wasn't clear what we had to do because how do you defend something that isn't a problem to begin with? And as we started looking through the DEA's evidence, one thing that was really shocking to me was how much work had been done on this, how much effort had gone into creating a false narrative that DIPT was a drug of abuse. This included the Operation Web Trip Raids, which resulted in people going to prison, in one case going to prison with a multi-hundred-year sentence. And what they found in the homes of these research chemical vendors or their offices was that, yes, they had bags of these chemicals, but they typically couldn't demonstrate that they or any of their customers were actually using them because that's quite difficult. So this is one of the comments that I saw when I posted this on Twitter. Someone said, well, does this invalidate the Federal Analog Act? Because if it didn't, this isn't really a victory. Well, this is the kind of thing that you don't want to explicitly say out loud because you don't want to tempt fate. But the reality is that the Federal Analog Act is used very rarely because it's difficult to demonstrate that somebody intended to consume something, right? If you raid someone's house and they have a vial with 5-MeO-MIPT in it, you can't prove that they intended to consume that. And if they have any involvement with a potential legitimate use, of which there are many now, you know, many people work in industries where there are legitimate uses for these sorts of things, then it becomes difficult to prosecute. Now, if it's in a capsule and the person breaks down and confesses and says, yeah, yeah, it's true, I intended to swallow that capsule and use it to elicit a reinforcing drug type effect that would be analogous to the effect of the Schedule One controlled substance LSD, then yeah, you're probably gonna get in trouble. But there's a reason the Federal Analog Act is rarely used. It is because it is difficult to effectively deploy against drug users. It is discretionary. The power of the Federal Analog Act is in frightening people because nobody wants to be in a position where they have to defend themselves against analog charges. This is also important because the research chemical industry depends on substances being non-explicitly scheduled. So you could say, what difference does it make? Well, it means that it makes it much harder for both gray and bona fide research chemical vendors to distribute these things for scientific use. And it makes it harder for everyone. I mean, it really does matter. The Analog Act is unfortunate, but it's a hell of a lot better to have a substance be potentially an analog and still totally accessible for scientific use than for it to be a Schedule One controlled substance. And I want to make a couple of notes about this conversation, which is with the great lawyer John Hunter, a man who I met many years ago because he was he's from Texas and he was interested in following up on my work on the murder of Stephen Pollock because he had legal resources and he thought he might be able to dig up additional information on the murder of Stephen Pollock. As far as I know, he was not able to dig up additional information, but we kept talking and eventually he started collaborating with Jason Wallach as an expert witness in some of his trials. There's actually a really interesting story about that that I'll save for another time. But John Hunter was so generous that he represented Jason and myself pro bono for months. I mean, this was a huge amount of work for everyone. I can't even begin to explain what a time-consuming mess this was. And when they announced that they were scheduling DOC and DOI at the same time, I just thought, I can't. DIPT alone is already too much. I can't do this as well. And thankfully, Mike Cunningham uh, focused on DOC and DOI. And I hope that the success that occurred with these five tryptamines will be repeated with DOC and DOI. But as you will hear in this conversation, this is a labor intensive process. So throughout the conversation, there are different things said. There's a little bit of a tone of psychedelic exceptionalism, which I try to avoid. When I say that you know DIPT especially shouldn't be scheduled, I don't think any of these substances should be controlled. I don't think that 
prohibition works as a strategy for mitigating the harms associated with drug abuse. So pretty much everything I'm saying about DIPT applies to heroin as well. But DIPT is especially ridiculous. It really highlights the absurdity of what they're doing. The Drug Enforcement Administration has 10,000 employees. Last year, the year with more overdose deaths than ever before in history, they received $3.13 billion in taxpayer money, money that could have been spent on harm reduction or education. It's a terrible thing that they have done. And the fact that there has been a small success is very encouraging to me. And there were other encouraging things that happened during these proceedings. We weren't alone. It wasn't just Jason, myself, and John Hunter. There were many other extremely passionate lawyers who were working on this simultaneously. And this is also a conversation with the lawyer, Matt Zorn, who is representing MindState, a psychedelic pharmaceutical company that is run by Thomas Ray, as well as Tactogen, another company that's run by Matt Baggett. So Matt Zorn was doing amazing work as well, especially uh, in terms of calling out field trip for their creepy prohibitionist claim where they said, well, our substance 4-hydroxy-DIPT is different than the others. The others should be made illegal, but not 4-hydroxy-DIPT. And this is another example of the absurd biases that exist in this community. As far as I know, that has never been publicized. Nobody has ever written about field trips, explicit attempts to support the prohibition of these other substances with the exception of the one that they were interested in. Meanwhile, conspiracy theories about Compass supporting prohibition circulate endlessly because the people that fund USONA are going to great efforts to ensure that those conspiracy theories are disseminated because it serves their business interests. This is just one example of the creepiness that happens in this commercial realm. But the flip side is that the muscle that the money in these commercial enterprises had, I think, was crucial to this success. I'm recording a brief clarification on the introduction that I recorded for Patreon because I saw some people that listened to the original podcast posting on Twitter about how terrible it is that Field Trip supported the prohibition of psychedelics in the context of their battle with the DEA. And I saw some people saying things like, well, this is why commercialization of psychedelics is bad. Isn't this inevitable? And first of all, I want to be very specific about what happened with Field Trip. So I'm going to read directly from field trips letter to the DEA so that there's no ambiguity whatsoever in what I am describing. So this is from a letter to the DEA from field trip that was obtained by the lawyer Matt Zorn. I quote from this and I will attach the full letter to the Patreon post. There's no way for me to do this on YouTube. There is an emerging body of peer-reviewed data that were not considered by the DEA in this rulemaking, reflecting that 4-hydroxy-DIPT has a remarkably different receptor profile directed at neural plasticity. This distinct receptor profile stands in stark contrast to the other four compounds that are the subject of this rulemaking and similar hallucinogenic street drugs of abuse. It is because of this novel receptor profile that FT-104, that is their code name for the glutarate ester of 4-hydroxy-DIPT, a 4-hydroxy-DIPT prodrug, it is because of this novel receptor profile that FT-104 holds such therapeutic potential. Indeed, several lines of evidence suggest that such serotonergic compounds have clinical potential for inducing therapeutically beneficial behavior changes in a variety of psychiatric conditions. Now, I don't know exactly what evidence they have for this claim. I would be surprised if this is truly the case, but the importance of this passage is that they are saying what we have is exceptional in contrast to these other four street drugs of abuse. So, it's not good what they did. It's also not worth uh, starting a war with them. I think that this is a little bit creepy. It's certainly not something that should be encouraged. But I also think it would be very short-sighted to look at this and say, this is why corporatization and commercialization of psychedelics is a bad thing and will support prohibition. Because the reality is that 
this success against the DEA came in no small part due to the efforts of these commercial enterprises. Tactogen, represented by Matt Baggett and Matt Zorn, were working very hard to prevent the prohibition of these substances, as was Mayan State, represented by Tom Ray and again Matt Zorn. Panacea also was working, and Jason and I were working as individuals, so we're not working as representatives of any corporate entity in that instance. But the reality is that most of the companies involved did the right thing. This was an outlier, and if you want to make any if you want to make any statement about the role that corporatization played in this, it would have to be a positive one because that was the major influence. This was a success, and the majority of the parties involved behaved in an ethical way opposing prohibition. And that's why I, I just want to be very clear about that. There are always going to be instances of people behaving creepily. You know, the MindMed CEO, Jamin, JR, Ron, uh, also said something about not wanting to be involved in legalization efforts. That is not ideal, but everyone is playing a very difficult game right now. And it's important to not let moralism and idealism cloud the pragmatic considerations that many of the people investing tens or hundreds of millions of dollars into this endeavor are making. So there's a big difference between not supporting legalization and supporting prohibition. I think that what Field Trip did is dipping a toe in dangerous waters, but it is not something worth getting, it's not something worth attacking them over. It's worth bringing up. I'm very glad that Matt Zorn discovered this, but I just want to be clear about what happened and not go on a unnecessary witch hunt because I, I don't think that that really helps anyone when we're all working toward, I think, a common good. I think in a previous podcast, I said that the DEA had tried to prevent our involvement with the hearing because we didn't have commercial interest. As it, I found out in this conversation, that's not exactly right. They did try to prevent us from participating, and we were lumped together with other people without commercial interest, but that apparently was not their explicit reasoning. So that was a misunderstanding on my part. But there's so much weird stuff that came out of this. The way that Arrowhead experience reports were weaponized against the psychedelic community. I mean, it's, it's really creepy to think that the processes that have emerged in this prohibitionist black hole, the things like Arrowhead that were created to protect people, are now explicitly being used by the prohibitionists to try to hurt people. I mean, it's, it's very creepy, and it does raise these questions that I hate about the politics of respectability. I don't like this idea that we should all, you know, do a Michael Pollan-ish thing where we just applaud anybody that's doing clinical work with psychedelics and deny the fact that the vast majority of people that use them are using them illegally. I don't think that's good. And I remember being very disturbed when a researcher at Yale, who I was consulting for the Salvia episode of my show, said, you know, I really hope that you don't show yourself consuming Salvia because that would not be good. And I remember thinking, oh, really? Why? Why is it bad to use a substance? Isn't that why we're all interested in this to begin with? We're supposed to deny that? But the flip side is the things that you say can and will be used against you. These Arrowhead reports were carefully scrutinized for anything that they could classify as abuse or toxicity. And even when I announced this on Twitter, you know, people saying things like, oh, right, now I can finally abuse DIPT or whatever. It's like, you know, I'm not really one to police other people's jokes, but part of me thought, like, mm, it's not the time. <laughs> not the time right now. Maybe make that joke to your friend. Maybe don't put it on the internet for people to see when it is now absolutely clear that they do look at things like that and use it to build cases against these substances. As a couple of final notes on this, almost immediately before the DEA withdrew their intention to prohibit DIPT, I had started a fundraiser with Cream, where we were selling uh, a few leftover copies of the pamphlet that are signed, DEA is a terrorist organization, hats and shirts, and there was a, a final uh, filter paper from a legal psychedelic synthesis that Jason and I had done. Um, for anyone that made those orders, they will be delivered, but we're going to also send out a 
letter to anyone that bought items for the fundraiser, letting them know that they can reverse their order if they don't want to. It, the money from the fundraiser will go to cover the legal costs that were incurred thus far, which John has really asked for almost no money just to cover things like, uh, you know, the cost of postage for various things like that, and maybe to put aside for a future hearing if HHS comes back with a revised statement about why DIPT should be made a Schedule One controlled substance. And then as a final, final concluding note before we get into this conversation, I think that if there's any optimistic and positive takeaway from this, it's that you should be involved, that it is possible to make change, that if you're a lawyer, you have tremendous power. If you're friends with a lawyer, get them involved. If you're a person, comment on the federal register entries, disseminate them on social media, make people know about this, because if you sit by idly and you don't do anything, they will trample all over us. The fact that we won this, and I do consider this a victory, is immensely inspiring. And one of the most inspiring things of all, and I mentioned this in passing during the conversation, is that Terry Del Cassin, the forensic chemist from the DEA, this very same chemist who Strike called the godfather of clandestine ecstasy manufacture, came through in the end and said that he agreed that DIPT should not be made a controlled substance and that he would testify for us in the hearing. What a great man. And I think that this also speaks to trying not to buy into this ridiculous us versus them mentality. You know, it would be so easy to look at someone like Terry Del Cassin and say, oh, he's a narc, he's a bad guy, you should never talk to him, fuck the police, right? That he chose to stand up for what was right in the end was immensely inspiring. And I think it shows that there's no good that comes from closing yourself off from other people. It's good to talk to people. It's good to communicate with people. It's good to be friends with people who have different views than your own because you never know when they might actually make the right decision and they might be a tremendous asset for whatever it is that you're doing. So I was really inspired by Terry's willingness to help what we were doing. And I was inspired by everyone that helped, whether it was with the fundraiser or commenting about it and sharing it on social media, commenting on the Federal Register entry, the lawyers who got involved. I mean, I do consider this a success, and I hope this conversation clarifies exactly why. Hello. This podcast is available unedited and ad-free at patreon.com slash Hamilton Morris. Each month, I release three to four new podcasts, and it was Patreon exclusive until recently. Many people contacted me and said they wanted me to figure out a way to make it freely available, and so I decided to accept sponsorship from a few of my friends. One of them is David Rentlin, the founder of a company called Lucy Nicotine. They make nicotine gum, nicotine pouches, nicotine lozenges, some of which are made with synthetic nicotine, which I think is pretty cool. Now, if you don't already use nicotine, I recommend that you don't start. It's habit-forming. But if you already do use nicotine products, and especially if you smoke tobacco cigarettes, I can say that this is a cleaner product. And it's also a product that I use personally. If you go to lucy.co and use the code Hamilton, you get 20% off your purchase. Thank you both for doing this on short notice. My, my pleasure. This is a, a very exciting week. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like the easiest thing to do would be to start at the beginning and just tell the story of how all of this happened, because I think for most people, all of this is so complicated. It's hard for them to understand how these laws are made, how people object to them, all of the work that you all were doing, it's just really not clear. So, um, and even what just happened, even to me, it's a little bit weird to historically contextualize what occurred. So it begins on January 14th of this year, the DEA announces their intention to prohibit 
five tryptamine psychedelics. And then I start scrambling, trying to figure out what to do. Nobody really knows what to do. I contact Rick Doblin and Ethan Nadelman and these various people that I think will know the appropriate course of action. And everyone is kind of unsure about what the next step is. And it was Jason's idea to reach out to you, John. So I'm, I'm curious about the minutia. What was the first step in all of this? Uh, first step for me was uh, figuring it out from the ground up. I, I do criminal defense primarily. I, I never dabbled my toes in the regulatory field at all. Um, but I was thrilled at the opportunity because uh, I see every day lots of people uh, having their lives ruined because of the Controlled Substances Act. And it, it struck me as a, a good idea to try and prevent that misery at the beginning of it. Um, so trying to acquaint myself with how exactly this works, you know, it, from the notice that was published, it appeared that it was in fact, um, the type of rulemaking that requires uh, due process, which includes, uh, the right to actually have a, a formal hearing on it with, um, the right to present evidence and to some extent, the right to cross-examine the evidence of the government. And, um, so because of that. Uh, it, it, if we needed to establish that you and Jason had standing to be able to to make that challenge. So you know, we we had to talk about the research that y'all have done um, and how that would be impacted by this. Um, but yeah, that that's how it started for me. It was figuring out as we went. Uh, Matt, I get the impression from the first time that you, you and I met that you've been watching this from before it happened and you obviously have a lot more experience in the regulatory field. Um, did you get wind that this was going to happen before it took place? No, I mean, the, the actual notice that Hamilton was talking about in January took, took me and I think just about everyone by surprise. Um, I think that, that shortly before that, there had been a notice to put MXE in the schedule one. And then after that, there's been a schedule to put DOI, but um, generally speaking, and I don't, I don't think anyone, because you know, you don't, you don't really get a window into what the agency is doing until they they post it for public and public consumption, and then you get what was it, thirty days to request a hearing. Um, what I will say is, you know, I, I spent spend a good deal of time past three years suing the DEA on um, and largely in public interest type matters. Um, so, so I certainly, you know. I, I get a subscription to its docket. So I, you know, day it comes out, I see it. Um, and, and I too, I read it like you did. And it, it just, there were a lot of things about it that seemed kind of off. Um, kind of a controlled substances act nerd from like the legal standpoint of, of everything. And I've read, I've read almost every scheduling action going back to 1970. And, and this one compared to earlier ones, and I'm sure we'll get into this just, just seemed flimsy. Um, but mo most important, it was based on on an outdated 2012 report, and that 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 was ultimately, I think. Well, I don't, I don't want to skip ahead, but that that's kind of what ultimately I think did this in. Yeah, that was a major surprise that it was such an old study that was predicating all of this. Um, you know, and that that was fairly evident from the beginning. Hamilton, you and Jason had acquired uh, the HHS report from before we even filed. Um, and that that was, in fact, a, a oddity from me that they could be relying on something that old. They would have delayed taking action for so long. Yeah, it was weird on many different levels. It was very old. I mean, even the report from 2012, even by the standards of 2012, it was already close to a decade old because the 2012 report was primarily describing things that had been observed a decade before that in the very early 2000s. It was mostly uh, related to Operation Web Trip raids. That was the, the substance of what was being described. And none of this really made sense to me, but none of it makes sense to me ever. And I actually had tried to make a piece trying to help the public better understand how a drug is made illegal because I remember someone asked me this question, how does it happen? How do they do it? 
And I said, oh, you know, lawmakers, they just can do it and nobody objects. And, and that's how it goes. And then afterwards, I thought, well, that was a pretty bad answer to that question. And I started, uh, you know, asking people who I thought were experts on the subject, like Ethan Nadelman, you know, saying, well, could you break this down? How, what, what are the steps that take place to make a chemical, a controlled substance? And Ethan Nadelman said, uh, you know, actually, I don't really know. And I thought, wow, if Ethan Nadelman doesn't know who is able to describe this, uh, maybe Matt, you could walk me through the steps that in the boxes that have to be checked in order for a previously uncontrolled chemical to become a controlled substance. Oh yeah, absolutely. So let me just quickly take a step back and um, do a little bit of history here, just 1970, because there's this big debate in Congress over who should be the one to do this, whether it's the attorney general, which is today DEA, or whether it should be the HHS or uh, FDA. And there's this big fight um, between the two of them and senators and lawmakers because half of Congress thinks it should be a health matter and the other half thinks it should be a law enforcement matter. So what we have today in the Controlled Substances Act is the compromise of the, that fight where the way it works is either DEA or FDA, HHS, whichever one you want to call it, identifies a drug of abuse. And that can come in a number of ways. That can come because some pharma company is working on some drug that might be addictive. Um, that can also just be, in the case of MDMA in the 1980s, it was used in therapy for years. And then all of a sudden in Dallas, people were using it in clubs. And so then DEA flagged it as an issue. If DEA flags it, they send a, a data report to HHS that documents, they collect data, law enforcement data. Um, in our case, they also collected drug discrimination data, which I hope we can talk about because, because you know, interestingly, Hamilton, I know about all the law, but I never kind of knew how the sausage was made until this, um, until we got to open up the hood a little bit. But so that data report is sent to HHS. They do what's called an eight-factor analysis, which there's a statute. It's got eight different factors they're supposed to look at. I don't know them all off the top of my head, but it's like the history and the current pattern of abuse, potential for abuse, uh, different factors, and they all kind of overlap. It's kind of a, a BS kind of framework, honestly. Um, they take that eight factors, this is FDA, and they send it back to DEA, and they give a recommendation and an evaluation as to these medical and scientific factors, which is supposed to be binding on DEA, and that recommendation is binding. So if HHS decides, you know what, we, we really don't think we should um, schedule this, then DEA can't go forward and schedule it. If FDA says, well, we should go forward and schedule it, then DEA can, can choose which schedule it wants to put the drug in based on a, sec a completely second set of, of statutory criteria, and that's the criteria in the schedule. So what we were doing in our, our proceeding was schedule one, which is, I think everyone kind of knows that one, is high potential for abuse, no currently accepted medical use, and lack of accepted safety for use. And over the years, effectively, schedule one has really been high potential for abuse and not approved by the FDA. Um, and that's kind of the net that these five tryptamines got caught up in, right? Because you guys are researching TIPT, my, my clients are researching a different one, and they aren't approved by the FDA, but DEA had this kind of strange data, which was suggesting that these chemicals were doing uh, things that they weren't necessarily doing, and that they were being abused in a way that that really weren't wasn't what I would consider to be a high propensity for abuse. Right, certainly not. But what was frustrating for me when I encountered these criteria is that because they make the rules, they can make rules that, as you said, are kind of bullshit, but because they've made them, it fulfills their criteria. So they say, okay, has it ever been abused? Well, if they can dig up one instance of somebody using the drug, that seems to be more than enough for them. And, and because the quality of the evidence can be so bad, then it's really not all that difficult for them. I mean, another more extreme example that I don't think I've talked about with either of you is they 
are moving to prohibit a tricyclic antidepressant called amineptine and place it in schedule one. This is a drug that has never been encountered in the United States and has never been implicated in a fatal poisoning internationally. So is it used in Russia too? Amineptine? Yeah, wasn't it like an antidepressant or something somewhere at one point? Tianeptine oh, okay. was, was yeah, more, right. more popular in Russia, but amineptine was used internationally as uh, I don't I don't know that it was it wasn't in the United States and it wasn't I'm not sure that it was in Russia but it was used throughout uh, most of Europe and Africa and uh, and so even with this insane these insane rules that they've created all they need is to find one instance it could be a, a report on a forum in many of these instances there were arrowed reports that are anonymous unverified contain no analytical information whatsoever, but that was enough. Here's a report of some guy saying they used it. That's abuse. Here's a report of someone saying that they maybe think their hearing was disturbed by DIPT. That's evidence of harm. Uh, we once raided some research chemical vendor and they had it. That's evidence that it's uh, being diverted, you know, so they can create these insane criteria. And what do you do in that situation? I mean, that this is what John and Jason and I were struggling with if if the rules that they've made are such that almost any drug arbitrarily could be said to be a drug of abuse. I mean, of course, this would apply if they wanted to. They could use this for just about anything. The, the bottom line is they have too much power. Um, and I mean, I think the one the one disappointment I have about this is that because it, it has ended the way it has ended, uh, there is not going to be any chance to talk about it in a a constitutionally created judicial court. But I think that there is uh, some evidence that some jurists would be open minded to the idea that Congress has over delegated its responsibility to the DEA. You know, the DEA is an executive level branch of government. Um, it it answers to the attorney general of the United States, who answers to the president of the United States. and you know, it, it, they're able to behave in an arbitrary and capricious way if they want to, because they decide how the criteria are defined. They decide what evidence is sufficient to meet those criteria. And so, uh, you know, if they wanted to ban um, caffeine, they could probably find a way to justify that to themselves. And as it presently stands, they're the only ones they have to justify it to. Um, and if we try to complain about that in federal court, if we try to sue them, the federal judges are going to have to defer to how those criteria were vetted through the administrative process and what decision was made. Uh, so essentially, we've been disenfranchised. We can't vote these people out of office. They usually survive from one administration to the next. Um, and I, it's a dire situation. But I hope that perhaps one of the things that is on their mind right now is that this represented a little bit too much of an abuse of their power and that there might have been repercussions had they continued forward with it uh, at a time when there's a lot of sensitivity to the issue about whether they're wielding that power effectively. Um, and it, it comes at right you know, shortly after another major victory for um, you know, the, the right to, you know, try whatever substance you want, the right to cognitive liberty, which is the, the Kratom cases. Um, so I, maybe maybe the, the high tide is receding backwards. I don't know. But I mean, but what was fundamentally different about the Kratom situation was that there was massive industry support. There was a, a multi-million user base in the United States, including uh, veteran groups that were probably more sympathetic to law enforcement and to DEA. And so you had all the same sorts of factors where, you know, there, there were very, very few fatal overdoses with Kratom that weren't poly substance overdoses. The evidence that it was posing a serious threat to public health was somewhat flimsy, but crucially, this was an important substance. It was a multi-million dollar industry. 
and something that millions of people used. The same was absolutely not true of any of these five tryptamines. These are obscure substances by any definition. It's not just an issue that they shouldn't be prohibited on the basis of drug prohibition being uh, a, a nonsensical, ineffective way of mitigating the harms associated with drug abuse. It just made no sense on any level. Um, and maybe Matt, I mean, do you have any idea how this happened? Why? I mean, it's everyone keeps asking this question. The closest I can come to an answer is maybe Teresa Carbonero, um, who had done a lot of the work, a lot of the pharmacology research that was the basis of the recommendation was it somehow involved, but that's the best I can come up with. That That's the best thing I've come up with too. I mean, there's a lot of things about the proceeding that I do know. Um, and, you know, but, but that's the thing I've been mulling over that I can't figure out. Um, and, you know, Teresa Carbonara was hired by DEA in September of 2018. And she brings, I guess, some, some chops on the psychedelic sort of standpoint or hallucinogenic is the word that's used in the statute. So, I mean, that's the only thing I could think of um, was now the interesting thing about her, right, was she wasn't around when this five tryptamines action was initiated. She wasn't around with I mean, she was in high school, I think, or right, right in college when Operation Web Trip was concluding. So, I mean, that that's how long this, this sort of evaluation process took. She wasn't she wasn't even close to there. In fact, the person who initiated all this still works at DEA, um, but they weren't even going to call that person in the hearing. Um, they were going to call Dr. Carbonaro, and that, that was going to be something that had it actually gone forward, we were going to point out was, hey, the person who's actually, who, who started all this is sitting back back at DEA. But no, Hamilton, I can't figure it out. Um, it's, it's kind of the thing that that I find, I mean, I guess the only other thing, right, is, you know, psychedelic medicine is being developed in, in a bunch of different quarters, and may, maybe DEA wants to sort of sort of tie up loose bows. I mean, they have this report, right? It's collecting dust on their desk. Maybe they're just tying up loose ends. I, I really don't know. And it's kind of hard to hard to figure out why. I, I I know in the case of DOI, DOC, and you know, that there was a different, there's a different factor at play there. Same thing with MXE, but but these five trip means I can't figure it out. And it, it's especially weird because I had some hope that this sort of research clinical psychedelic renaissance would liberalize things as well as the Biden administration. The fact that Hunter Biden has been open about his use of psychedelics to treat his addiction problems. I mean, it means that it's absolutely certain that Joe Biden is aware that his son has a substance abuse problem and that he attributes uh, his sobriety in part to using psychedelics. So that would seem to be good. And I think Biden appointed a new head to the DEA, which I would have assumed would have been someone more liberal than whoever was operating during the Trump administration. And then it just seems like it's worse than ever. You know, the DOI thing as well is, is especially egregious because it feels like something intended to hobble scientific research more than something intended to prevent drug abuse. Yeah, I mean, who, who's who's out there, like, honestly, using DOI by choice? Like, that is not, I mean, it doesn't sound to me like a, a fun, what is it, 24 hours? How long does it last? Like, Even longer sometimes. Yeah, so, so like, what is this, you know, the interesting thing, and this was a point we were going to make, is there are plenty of drugs on which you can trip or, you know, whatnot, hallucinate, whatever you use, you want to, nutmeg was, was the one that I, one of my witnesses was going to, testify to it's like you nutmeg you can buy at the store and it's a bad it's not like you can trip on it it's not like a desirable one um and i'm sure a lot of people know about like hawaiian baby woodrow seeds which i mean frankly that that's not even a terrible trip but you know the dea is not cracking down on these things so so why are they going after something like doi which is demonstrably useful in all sorts of research i mean it, it makes no sense forget the, the law and their their frameworks and everything like from a policy perspective like what are they doing and again i have that same open question as you like i don't know but it doesn't really make sense to me and then there was a period where it seemed like their chosen tactic was emergency scheduling which allowed them to bypass i mean do they even require any kind of congressional approval for any of this 
not for emergency scheduling. No, I mean emergency scheduling. Not only do they not need Congress for that, they did that. You can't even go to a court for judicial review. Like the statute says, like you cannot seek judicial review of emergency scheduling. And it used to be that you could emergency schedule for, I think it was one year, and that was passed after MDMA. I mean that the MDMA. A lot of people talk about MDMA for a lot of different reasons, but it's actually like a critical point in like the history of drug law. Two, two, two different laws come out of that. One, the Analog Act, and two, the emergency scheduling. And um, it used to be one year, but now it's three years. So DEA can basically, without any judicial review, if something presents an imminent hazard to the public safety, they can just put any any schedule, any drug on, on schedule one. I think the problem in this case with the five tryptamines, right, was they had this report on their desk since 2012. So what credible case could they say that this presented like an uh, imminent hazard to the public safety? I mean, obviously it didn't. Right, right. So, uh, okay, so back to the sort of uh, meat and potatoes. So what was the first, uh, I'm interested in the actual steps that went into this. So. The first thing was what, filing a request for a hearing or how did it begin? Right, right. We had to, we had to request a hearing. We have to make sure the DEA knows that uh, you all had an interest in this, that you were objecting and that you wanted to participate in the hearing process. So we um, sent out letters to the DEA, filed them in multiple different places just because wanted to be thorough that they received it. Um, and that, that put us on the docket in the hopper with uh, Matt's clients, with um, David at uh, Panacea. Um, I believe there was uh, someone else who was later sort of knocked out by the judge's order. Um, I'm blanking on her name, but uh, at any rate, th those were the, the individuals who were able to participate. A anyone can submit comment. I mean, and there were hundreds of comments submitted uh, for this proposed scheduling. But a lot of them are, you know, one liners, uh, you know, drugs shouldn't be illegal or the DEA is bad, you know, those kinds of things. But uh, you had to specifically invoke the right to participate in the hearing in order to get started. Um, and then from there, uh, we had a status conference with the judge and she laid out a, a schedule, which um, from my point of view was a very backbreaking pace. I mean, my God, it was seemed like every week we had to do something um, significant, uh, you know, which we, we managed. Um, everyone, everyone did their part. We had you and you and Jason did amazing work. Um, all of the witnesses that we uh, got in touch with did amazing work. But I, I couldn't help but think that um, even, even though the judge re reiterated several times that she'd given us a lot of time uh, to prepare things that really this was uh, almost not possible. I mean, the, the pace that she set was very difficult to comply with. And it struck me that if, um, if we had not such a good team of people, and if we had not had such a passion about this, we may not have been able to get it done in the, the timetables that she set for us. And weren't they also attempting to deny us a hearing at all? I mean, like you said, there was one woman who was objecting who was denied uh, the opportunity to participate. So what are the criteria to even be able to say, I object to this? Who is allowed to object and who isn't? Yeah, I mean, the legal, I mean, the legal standard is interested person. Um, and and I, I think I think with, with you and Jason it was like absolutely clear kind of on its face that you guys were doing research with the substance. Um, but there was a question as to my clients as to whether or not they had the right to be there. Um, that was resolved pretty quickly with, with Matt Baggett Tactogen because on their website, it was like, we are researching this, this tryptamine. Um, and then with the other, with, with my other client, my, they, we had to do a little briefing and kind of explain, but they were also trying to narrow like what we were able to challenge, um, like whether or not we were able to challenge like the other the other tryptamines that we we weren't necessarily actively re actively researching, but might have been interested in. Um, so the standard is you have to be an interested person, and this gets back to what we were talking about earlier of like you know the agency gets to interpret the the laws and according to its own rules and everything, and they were trying to interpret it in a way to kick us out or narrow it. 
And uh, I don't, the judge didn't, the, the judge presiding over this didn't buy that in the end. Um, and she allowed us to go forward on all five, but they, they were trying to limit this, which, you know, if we had been kicked out, right, then it would have rubber stamped, it would have just gone right, right forward. There would have been no more hearing and it would have just been, been done, except you guys would have had DIPT. We would have been able to keep challenging when we were researching. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong, John, but didn't they actually object to us participating and, and question whether Jason and I were interested parties? They did, uh, but they backed off of that. Um, you know, I think that they were confused in part because you know we had made the decision to go only on DIPT because that that's what you all had been ex expressly studying and researching. So I wanted to make sure that we we our position was very clear and crystal, you know, not, not going to be confused with any of the other drugs. Um, and so I think the government wanted to just make sure that we stayed in the lane that we had designated for ourselves, uh, that we weren't going to uh, file a bunch of testimony about the other tryptamines that were on the list, um, which was fine by me because, you know, in my mind, one of the things that was very frustrating about it, I mean, even in Dr. Carbonero's final testimony that was submitted, it, it's, it was so baby with the bathwater. You know, I mean, it'd be like if you had these five drugs and then um, black tar heroin in the same list. And, you know, we're going to we're going to make a decision on all of them based upon, you know, any criteria for any one that is offending. And, and that struck me as a really strange way to do this. Like each of these drugs should be independently assessed and a decision made on it. So I, I was happy that we were uh, staying in that lane and that that's what the government uh, expected of us because it didn't strike me that we had as concrete or strong of a claim for an interested person for the other chemicals. Um, but yeah, there was a moment there where I just don't think it was well worded. It it read like they were trying to kick you guys out of the litigation, but they clarified that at a, at a hearing and we didn't have any problems. Because yeah, weren't they saying that because we were scientists researching it, that wasn't sufficient? Like we would have to have some kind of uh, industry association or some kind of commercial connection to the substance? No, it wasn't, it wasn't quite that. I mean, it was a footnote kind of a thing. I mean, it, it was a very just sort of a, we don't necessarily think that they have standing either and we'll address that in later briefing. And then we had a hearing and I'm like, what, why don't you think these, these guys have standing? And the government was like, well, we don't, we don't actually take that position. We agree that they can challenge on DIPT. So they, they never really went anywhere with that. I'm not sure what they were thinking. Um, so they may have gotten us mixed up someone else or something. I don't know. I'm going to pause momentarily for an ad. This podcast is also brought to you by the Apollo. The Apollo is a wearable vibrating bracelet or anklet that appears to be able to modulate your consciousness. And when I first heard about this thing, I was very skeptical. I was at a conference and met a psychiatrist and neuroscientist named David Rabin, and he had built this prototype and let me wear it for a night. During the entire night, I felt very calm and euphoric and good. And I thought, okay, well, maybe this is just placebo. But I also told him that if he ever built more of them, I'd really like to try it again. So he sent me one. And now I've used it for hundreds of hours. It's a very versatile, wearable device that they are selling for stress relief. But you can modulate the frequency of the vibrations to create either a stimulating or calming effect. You can actually sleep wearing it and it seems to help sleep or you can change the frequency and it has a sort of stimulating effect, which I sometimes use while I'm on a long drive. I've tried a lot of these different non-pharmacological means for alteration of consciousness, like binaural beats and various types of stroboscopic visual stimulation. Usually I'm skeptical of this sort of thing, but this tactile modulation of mood actually does seem to work. The idea being that it delivers a gentle, soothing vibration that conditions your nervous system to recover and rebalance after stress. That's the idea. It's sort of like a vibrating chair or strapping a purring kitten to your leg. If you find a purring kitten calming, then I think you would also find this calming. It's a similar sort of phenomenon. If you're interested in getting one of these devices, you can go to apolloneuro.com to read more about it and use the promo code HAMILTON for 10% off. Thank you, Apollo. Okay, so then both of us, both groups are 
granted this hearing. And so the next step then was to assemble a defense of these substances, which again was a difficult task. I know that Jason and I were scrambling, trying to figure out what would be persuasive to them because they're using such bad evidence to begin with. Do you meet them with equally bad evidence? Do you play the same game? Do you meet them with good evidence? What would be persuasive to them? My thinking, and I'm somewhat glad that I didn't do this. I was going to, you know, attempt to pay out of pocket to commission conditioned place preference and self-administration studies in rodents, because they seem so fixated on the way rodents respond to these things, especially when there's an, any, uh, a total absence of information relating to human abuse. You know, it, it, like, I don't think any drug should be prohibited, but if a drug is truly a threat to public health, you should have no problems whatsoever finding at least one published instance of somebody dying after using that substance with post-mortem confirmation that this is the causal agent in their death, right? If this were, for example, heroin, you would have no difficulty finding evidence that somebody had fatally overdosed taking heroin, that an unambiguous instance of this having occurred. And you should be able to demonstrate that people use the substance. There are law enforcement seizures where people have it and they're intending to consume it. You should be able to demonstrate that it is distributed with some degree of frequency. They couldn't do any of those things. And so the emphasis was placed on rodent studies. And with these studies, you can, you know, you can game these any way that you want. This is not only a law enforcement phenomenon, it happens routinely in scientific research as well. And so you say, okay, well, this drug partially substituted for LSD and LSD is a drug of abuse. Therefore, DIPT is a drug of abuse because this rodent treated it like LSD. So my thinking was, okay, well, what if we show that in these uh, somewhat conventional addiction models like self-administration and conditioned place preference that DIPT does not demonstrate any indication of the sort of uh, rodent behavioral abuse indications that would be observed with like an, an opioid or something like that. That was what I was thinking would work. But again, this just felt like, you know, who knows what works? Do you invalidate the quality of their evidence? Do you point out that Arrowhead experience reports are not verifiable? Do you, uh, what do you do? And it was really hard. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Matt, what your strategies were, what sort of defense you were assembling. Yeah. So a couple things on that. The first is it's a great idea. And it, I think if the science were, if the science this process were, I'll just use the word a little more honest, Hamilton, that that's, that's what I would do too. The, the problem is even in that eight factor report, DEAs and Carbonara's testimony, they basically say like, we, we know this stuff does, isn't addictive, that animals don't reliably self-administer these compounds. So it's like, they're, they're already admitting that. And then they're still going forward and, and going with schedule one. So, um, you know, I had to, I, I was always, I mean, John can tell you, like I was fixated on the drug discrimination study from like the very beginning, these, these rodents. It turns out that they, they used six lab rats in North Texas from 2006, pulled the, the, um, the, the right, the levers. I had to teach myself all about full substitution and partial substitution. And, um, and the, the idea that the way they structure the studies is that they keep escalating the, the dose of the um, the test substance, the test drug, until it either A, fully substitutes, or B, the rodent isn't capable of continuing with the, the process. So it, it, it it's like the way they test it is like they're trying to find full substitution. And then they they not only test it against LSD, like you said, then they try it with DOM. And if it doesn't work with DOM, they try it with MDMA. And if it doesn't work with MDMA, they try it with cocaine. So it's like, it's almost like you get up to, it's like a, in a baseball game, if you like get up to bat and you strike out and then they just send another batter up there until they make contact. And then once they make contact, they say, oh, this is like DOM. And since DOM is a high potential for abuse, so does this drug. And so... I mean, look, I'm I'm still not, I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm a lawyer. I, I do patent litigation. And so I study a lot about science and I'm a pretty quick study, but, but man, like th this, 
it just doesn't smell right. Like this drug discrimination with like rodents. And then, you know, I started reading the literature and it's like, yeah, this is kind of state of the art in one sense, but it's like no credible scientist doing this in like yourself or, or anyone doing this in 2022 is going to like actually like use this and this alone. Like you're going to look at the assays, you're going to look at the human experience, you're going to look at other other items. It's just kind of like one of the things you look at, but it really, this was their case. So to your question of like, what was, what was our defense going to be? Well, you know, we got one witness, we had David Nutt come in and basically say like, look, like I get that you're comparing these to schedule one drugs like LSD, but it turns out that those drugs aren't really high potential for abuse either. So if you're saying that these tryptamines are like LSD, then you're not really saying much. It's, it's kind of this syllogism or this like reasoning that they have of, well, these five tryptamines are like all of these psychedelics that back in 1970, we didn't really know too much about. I mean, you know, people forget, like people thought that LSD caused like damage to chromosomes used in recreational love, like, which is like insane. Um, but then of course, what, 20, 30 years later, it was like MDMA causes holes in the brain. So it's like, we're just even learning about what these things are doing nowadays. And his point was like, look, like, you know, you can't just compare these to the other drugs because the other drugs are called into question. Um, Matt Baggett, um, who's at Tactogen, talked about the drug discrimination studies and we took it, took that apart. And then we put in a bunch of data or a bunch of like testimony. We put in a, a chemist who, and I think you guys had to put in a chemist too. Was it you or Jason or someone who basically said like, yeah, the fact that these are analogs doesn't really tell you much of anything. Like, so what? Like analogs can be different because of the way that the, the body works. It's not like looking at like, a piece of paper and the molecular structure is the same. And then, you know, our final point, I think this was a really powerful one was, hey, like this stuff is really outdated. Um, and that was kind of a point for uh, if we did have to go to a federal court to basically say like, this statute requires them to look at current information. Everyone in this proceeding agrees this stuff isn't current. I, I think the only other point I, I would sort of highlight here is what's like, what are the evidentiary standards? So theoretically, the agency has the burden of proof, right? So they have the burden of proving that these things belong into schedule one. But even though they have the birth, so our case, basically, I think your case, I think our case, I think all of our cases was less about proving that these things had a low potential for abuse and more about just negating the government's proof, saying they didn't prove, like what six lab rats do in Texas, you know, especially with DIPT. I mean, look, that wasn't the one we were studying, but certainly I knew a lot about it because I had to learn about all of them. And it was like, it was clearly the odd duck, right? Like it, it was kind of insane. Some of the things they were saying, it was like DIPT is like DMT. It's like nobody in their right mind would ever say that in humans, those two things have like, are even in the, like the same like functional ballpark, but that's what they were, that's what they were saying based on these rats. So we were, I think what we were going to do, right. If we ever got to that hearing was like, they didn't meet their burden of proof. The problem with that type of case is, so we go to the, the administrative law judge and she puts down some recommendation as to like whether or not they met their burden of proof. That goes right to the DEA administrator who can basically reinvent the wheel. And all she has to do is find what's called substantial evidence in the record to support putting these in schedule one, which is such a uh, uh, deferential standard. It's substantial evidence is not like court with preponderance of the evidence. In a normal civil court case, you have the burden of showing 51% of the evidence, like more likely than not. Substantial evidence is kind of like 25% or like it's something like a reason, like a no reasonable person would, like it lacks substantial evidence and no reasonable person could look at the evidentiary record and come to the conclusion. So it basically it's like, it's a really bad situation, right? As long as the government was able to put in like enough evidence that, another federal judge and, and these federal judges are going to sign off basically on what DEA was doing. So, you know, one of the things we really focused on for our defense was focusing on the law saying, look, it doesn't matter if these have a high potential for abuse or not, the law, need, they need to get a current evaluation. And we, so we were really focused on that. And, and ultimately like that, when we look at the thing, the withdrawal, that's what they say. They say, we're, we're going to go back and get a current evaluation from HHS. And I think that that's potentially what they were most afraid of was that that they just they didn't have the the current evaluation that they needed to move forward. Right. And one of the most troubling things that I encountered when I was working with John 
was the number of qualified experts who had something to say about this, but were afraid. And that really disturbed me that the DEA is so irrational and so powerful that many people just don't want the hassle. They don't want to get involved with this. And on some level, I can't blame them because this is a world where a lot of people don't want to draw attention to themselves. They want to do the work. They're not interested in this because they're drug policy crusaders. They're interested in it because they're scientists and they don't want to make waves. And there were a number of people who I spoke to who said, I'm completely on your side. I also research these compounds. I think this is insane, but I just can't risk it. And that in and of itself was so frightening to me to think that we've reached a place where people are afraid to speak out. Yeah, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll chime in here because, you know, it, it really is a problem. And, and I think it's a problem for, for two reasons. One is like, it's kind of like, you actually don't see this in other industries, right? Like the big oil industry, they, they will sue EPA. Um, the, the telecoms will get in the face of FCC if they need to. Um, big pharma and FDA. I mean, they're they're. I don't know if they're opposed to each other so much as they, they work in tandem. Um, so it, it's this funny relationship in this controlled substances space between the regulated and the regulated for, um, where there isn't much activity. And, and the problem, and this gets to my second point, is you know what we've been talking about is kind of like the DEA is like we're talking about the problem of executive power and everything. I mean, the way you check this often is you go to court and you sue them under the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, and that's, it, it's kind of like being in a relationship and drawing boundaries, right? It's like, you know, you don't want to be difficult all the time. If you sue your regulator all the time, then yeah, they might have a bad opinion of you and they might not like you. On the other hand, if you never do anything to check them, then they just walk all over you. And that, that's what I didn't understand about this, right? Is, you know, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, Hamilton. And I think that's kind of the prevailing like thought, you know, but I mean, the other thing you have to think about is like, okay, it's not you this time, but it might be you next time. Um, and, you know, if they set this kind of precedent of being able to schedule these five compounds on, on flimsy, outdated evidence, you know, maybe it's not the trip to mean you're working on this time. And maybe it's maybe it's going to maybe it is going to be the one you're working on next time. And then they're going to point back to this proceeding and say, well, we were able to do it this this last time. So we're able to do it this time. So, you know, I, I, I do think that this industry is not completely legally sophisticated um, when it comes to the DEA and sort of being a regulated industry because it's illegal. Right. I mean, because the money is just starting to flow into it. And this is, you know, there are always arguments for and against whether, you know, the industry should take money and everything and whatnot. And I mean, one of the strong four arguments is you need to potentially push back on your regulator sometime. And then sometimes that costs a little bit of money and capital and whatnot. And, you know, a lot of scientists and researchers can't do it. So I think that, I think that it's, it's, it's a really interesting observation and it's a really important observation that, you know, people were kind of not willing to, to come forward because they were worried that that their licensing or whatnot it, it kind of speaks volumes about where we're at at this moment in history yeah well, and, and the one key thing is unlike those other regulatory agencies the dea has in addition to the power to take away your license or to, you know, to debar you from federal contracting the dea also has the power to put you in prison um which has a huge chilling effect on the intellectual community coming together to testify against uh, their activity because um, you know they're, we don't have ex post facto law. They can't put you in prison for something you did before it was illegal, but um, they certainly can turn up their scrutiny on you. And uh, that can make things very uncomfortable. Uh, I think that, again, it goes to where are the independent checks on, on the regulator's power? Um, you know, th this agency, in this particular case, this agency was not only going to have the, the be the one receiving the evidence, prosecuting the case, making the final rule decisions, 
and then ultimately prosecuting anyone who violated the rule. But um, also because they were relying on such an old study, they functionally had cut HHS out of the equation. So th they're not even abiding by the check that the Controlled Substances Act has put in place, which is that they need to talk to HHS before they, they make a decision to propose a rule. That wasn't even really in play here. So, um, you know, checks and balances are what makes sure that this is a fair system. When they're not in place, bad things happen. One of those bad things is a chilling effect on the scientific community. Yeah, yeah. And this, I think, is one of the, the first moments that I felt that, you know, there's been a lot of hand wringing in the psychedelic community about the impact of commercialization. And this was a time where I felt that unambiguously, this could be a very good thing because you had people with money who were willing to speak out, who had serious business interests in these compounds. And paradoxically, I think that's the kind of thing they listen to maybe even more so than people doing basic scientific research. They seem to have some respect for industry that doesn't exist or doesn't extend to uh, common people or scientists. And so I thought, okay, now there's some muscle behind this. Now there's some real effort coming from several different groups simultaneously. And it was, it made me optimistic in a way that I've never felt previously in any of these scheduling actions. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think if you look at the history of how many times has scheduling been pulled, um, you know, there's Kratom. That's that's an, that's kind of a weird situation, right? Where there was the temp, there was the emergency scheduling that was pulled by DEA. Then they were going forward with permanent scheduling, and then HHS stepped in and withdrew its recommendation. So it's kind of like a weird case. I can only think of one other time where a scheduling was reconsidered. It wasn't pulled in the way like here, but it was, it was in 1987. It was, uh, um, I think the drug was Tylamine and, and some, some combination drug. Um, and it was pulled because an industry person stepped up and said, Hey, this would, this would make it really hard for me to, uh, carry forward. Um, and, but yeah, hey, they do pay attention to industry a little more. I think than than the scientists and I mean you know but the but the other thing also is like this wasn't like MDMA in the sense that like there were there was an active recreational scene so yeah that was a lot of the focus of our case and your case um, was that the chilling effects on a research industry that is looking to actually produce medicine um, I know you know that's kind of what Dr Becker said when you guys put that witness statement in and. We had Dr. Averill kind of say that, like, look, you know, these veterans or these medicines could potentially help veterans so that the political climate is changing. And, you know, when you have legitimate researchers and in industry coming up and saying, like, that's exactly what I'm trying to do, what these people are talking about, um, it's kind of a bad look. And so I think it is hopeful. But, you know, there, there's it's exactly what you're saying, Hamilton, in the sense of like, yeah, money's coming in, industry's coming in, but that does add an air of credibility when you try to do things like this um, that, you know, 10, 20 years ago didn't exist, right? So it's it's like you can't look at these things as being universally bad or universally good. Sometimes they're good, sometimes bad. Right. And also, I'm not sure if I'm misrepresenting this, but it was my impression that there was some controversy surrounding matt johnson and field trips involvement because field trip is selling a 4-hydroxy dipt pro drug as one of their lead compounds and matt johnson is an advisor for field trip and he objected to the scheduling action so the first wave of controversy which i thought was unfair to matt johnson was that he was only standing up for this because of his financial involvement with field trip how dare he well as far as i'm concerned i don't care if someone's doing it because they're financially involved, I think that if you're doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, it doesn't bother me. It's still the right thing. And I don't think he was actually doing it for the wrong reasons either. Then I heard a rumor that field trip was claiming that the other substances should be controlled, just not for hydroxy DIPT. Is that correct? Yeah. Let me, let me, let me, let me speak on that. Cause the first thing doesn't bother me, right? Like um, you can stand up for what you're doing without kind of, tearing other people tearing the others down i mean it to some extent you're speaking from what you know and you're just you don't know about the others um or you know there are a variety of reasons that so that that didn't bother me 
as much. But yeah, in the field trip letter, um, they submitted a letter and then they said, we concur with DEA's decision to schedule the other four compounds, except the one that they were researching. And that, that, you know, that, that bothered me deeply. And I told them I was going to subpoena them and bring them down so that they could explain that. Also, their letter was like half redacted, so you couldn't even read it. And so I, I didn't think it was, you know, if you're going to say that, right, that that's kind of putting yourself out there. If you don't say that, then, you know, I got, you know, you want to talk about your substance and you don't want to talk about the other four. That's fine with me. But I, I, I could not understand that, especially since half the letter was talking about how there wasn't much abuse data for what they were studying. And it's like, well, that's true of all the compounds. So what what is it that why, why are you coming to the conclusion that that these other four should be on schedule one? And I think that that's that's kind of like taking to the next level what we were talking about. Some people are trying to avoid being put on DEA's radar. And I think what, what that statement was, was they were just kind of trying to like butter up DEA to say, oh, we, we totally agree with what you're doing with the other four. We support your mission. But let me tell you about the one we're studying. Um, and I wouldn't have done that. If I were, if I were the lawyer for them, I would, that's not what I would have. I wouldn't have said that. I would have just kind of touted what I was doing and just kind of stayed out of the fray on the other other four. Right. And that's the the other aspect of this as well is from DEA's perspective, this is a bad idea. This is it's not just wrong. It's bad in the sense that it makes the DEA look evil. The DEA doesn't benefit from having an adversarial relationship with the scientific community or industry. And by choosing these substances that have no conceivable abuse potential that are not a threat to public health, they're making themselves look even more evil than they already are perceived to be. And I, this was the argument that I made when I reached out to a friend of mine who was a former analytical chemist for the DEA, Terry Del Casson. And I said, you know, and he, in, when we talk to each other, he has one condition, which is that he will not criticize DEA, which is fine with me. So I was saying to him, you know, if you like the DEA, and you care about the DEA, then it is in your best interest to oppose this action because this is bad for everybody. This doesn't benefit the DEA. This doesn't benefit anyone. This is a lose-lose situation for everybody involved. And he actually agreed. Yeah, yeah. Terry, Terry's a magnificent guy. Wonderful to talk to. Um, you know, very clearly is in it for the love of the pure science. And uh, I mean, yes, he's very loyal to the DEA. I respect someone who uh, respects the institution that they worked for for so long. Uh, but, uh, it, it was a really enjoyable time to chatting with him about this. And I, I, I wish we'd been able to get more of his input in front of the tribunal, The government, uh, was especially perturbed that we had tried to get him under subpoena and, uh, regrettably the judge agreed with the government's objection, but I think that in the long run, that would have been beneficial to us in terms of what we were trying to do with the criticisms of the rest of the government's uh, evidence regarding the pattern of abuse and the history of abuse, because they wouldn't let us uh, subpoena Terry and they wouldn't give us any of the underlying data behind why they claimed that you know, Operation, Operation Web Trip had yielded evidence of abuse. Uh, so what were we supposed to do? You know, we can't put on any affirmative evidence. We can't look at the underlying data you're relying upon. Uh, we can't get Mr. Del Casson here to talk about what he knows about it. So, uh, you know, why should you be allowed to put in this evidence at all? Right. And one of the things that Terry Del Casson was arguing was that, okay, these are already covered by the Federal Analog Act. So if this becomes an issue, if we suddenly find a spate of people abusing 5-MeO-DET and it's a public health issue, then can it not be prosecuted as an analog of 5-MeO-DMT or DET or any number of other substances? Why is it even necessary to place all these additional substances in Schedule 1 to begin with? I mean, do either of you have any insight on that question? I mean, I, I know the answer to it, and I think, John, you maybe you do too, is, you know, it's hard to prosecute under the Analog Act um, because it's, it, it then becomes a criminal matter where you have to prove that the drug is not only a structural analog, that's that's not too difficult, um, and that, but that it has a similar pharmacological effect 
And in a criminal trial to prove that, you're going to have to bring someone, a, an expert down um, to wherever the trial is. In other words, it's in Southern District of Indiana, Southern Indiana, and you're in federal court there. DEA is going to have to fly an expert out there or the government's going to have to hire an expert. So it's impractical on a large scale, but I agree with what uh, what, what Del Kaysen was going to say, which is, yeah, sure. Like, if this were like a widespread problem and you had to do this on a regular basis, it, it is a problem. But if you're only talking about like, you know, a couple spates of like, you know, once a year or something like, yeah, so you get your expert to show up once a year. I mean, I think what, what's happened is there's a, there's a couple problems with the Analog Act that's not well drafted. Um, I believe Joe Biden was one of the, the key drafters of it, just FYI. But um, but um, it, 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 him in, uh, who is it? Strom Thurmond, I think those those are the two. Um, you know, Joe Biden just interestingly, I, I think it was fairly recently, or I don't know what it was, but it, he he once said every single drug piece of drug legislation to ever come out of this chamber has had my name on it. Um, so oh. just just something. There's there's like a video of him saying that. Um, so just something to to be aware of, and and I think the Analog Act is one of them. It's not it's not the best drafted legislation. I mean, I, I'd almost wish it were a little tighter. Like in other words, a little stricter, if that would get fewer compounds put in Schedule One. In other words, if they could use the Analog Act to not impede research, to not go after like low-level folks, but like if a research chemical vendor is diverting, if they were able to go after those, but like that, like is that necessarily what I want? I don't know, but that is preferable to them knee knee jerking things into Schedule One, right? Like. That that was the obvious resolution to to these to what all these five trip to meets. Like it's 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 obvious. And then they don't have to go through the trouble of you know having six lab rats in Texas do some some sort of study. It's it, they're obviously analogs. And if they, you know, if maybe if the analog act were written in a slightly different way so that research could go forward, um, but human consumption, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I'm not one of those folks who thinks that DA shouldn't exist. Um, but I really don't like the Controlled Substances Act. Like, I really think it's a bad law. Um, but, you know, we do have a fentanyl crisis, and I'm not suggesting, you know, we should be focused on harm reduction. But again, I, I'm not saying we don't need we don't need to have a DEA, but, you know, it has 10,000 employees. I mean, do we need 10,000 of them? I don't know. I, probably not. <laughs> uh, I am one of those crazy people <laughs> that does not believe the DEA should exist. Um, but yeah, no, the, it would be very hard to prosecute a lot of things under the Analog Act, but that would be the I, my preference between the two choices um, because it, it would allow for meaningful criminal due process protection in the fundamental inquiry about what is the drug and why are we here today to put someone in prison for it? Um, you know, what you do when you put something on one of the schedules is you cut off an entire avenue of potential debate. Um, you know, I, I was really taken with uh, the interview you did, Hamilton, of uh, Casey Hardison um, regarding uh, his trial in England for manufacturing LSD. And he made these cognitive liberty arguments. You know, uh, they were perhaps it would have been better if he had had a lawyer to assist him in that. But you can't really make those kinds of arguments in a criminal trial in the United States, unless you are just a martyr and you want to go to prison. Um, in large part, you can't make arguments about the safety of the drug, whether it's really abuse, um, what the effects are, whether those effects are, are desirable, because that's already been litigated. And it's been litigated behind the veil of the administrative process. The same things that we've been talking about here that if DIPT had become scheduled, we, we'd be cut off from discussing that in a criminal courtroom. And um, the prosecution under the Analog Act does let you have some of that debate uh, about the chemistry, the pharmacology, uh, abuse and um, addiction, all those kinds of things become part of the, the story. Uh, the downside to it is that it doesn't give you notice of what's criminally prohibited, right? I mean, who decides if it's an analog? The person who's presenting this case to a grand jury fundamentally decides whether it's an analog. And um, that that has its own set of problems because now the public can't predictably understand what's going to get them in trouble and what's not. Um, so they, they both have their 
their downsides, but I'd rather live in a world where we were fighting about the Analog Act because it would give us more things to debate, uh, which I, I think juries are capable of figuring out. You'd also have more clients. Yeah, there, there is that. There is that. Uh, of course, you know, that would be hopefully step one of the ultimate goal of just simply legalizing drugs. I'm going to pause momentarily for an ad. This podcast was also brought to you by Matcha.com, a source of organic, high-quality, heavy metal-tested matcha from Japan. This is a company founded by psychedelic pioneer and matcha aficionado Andrew Weil. They have a variety of interesting matchas, including freeze-dried matcha cubes and a matcha sampler pack. All products are 20% off if you use the code HAMILTON. I especially recommend the freeze-dried matcha cubes they are calling Space Matcha. It's very delicious. It dissolves instantly in water, and you can even dissolve it in your mouth and use it like a snack. It's a very futuristic product. I carry a bag of them around in my backpack. If you visit matcha.com and use the code HAMILTON, you get 20% off and a free gift. Thank you very much, matcha.com. Right. And then that is the next question is, nobody seems to understand exactly why this happened, why now, what is going on? And after they withdrew their intention to prohibit these substances, I was talking with Rick Doblin and he said, why? Why did they do it? What did you all do? What do you think the decisive factor was? Was it the robust legal intervention from multiple groups? Was it the 500 plus comments that were made on the federal registry entry? What was it that caused them to back down? Because this is unprecedented. Nothing like this has ever happened in history. So what do you all think happened? We're the best lawyers ever. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I think I think Matt Matt Zorn, it may well in fact be one of the best lawyers ever. His um approach, his tactics, his strategy was uh, a really beautiful thing to watch unfold. Um he saw he played the long game and the short game. Um which means he thinks like a criminal defense attorney. Yeah, you, you, you may not win today, but you can win tomorrow. I think the DEA saw the writing on the wall about several of those issues, particularly the arguments that were advanced about how they had delayed too long in obtaining um, and proceeding forward after the HHS letter. But also, I mean, one of the things that I keep pondering is how many mistakes the government made in this. Um, from start to finish, I mean, from, from the delay from the HHS being the major one, but um, you know, some, some troubling mistakes regarding some very simple, oh, should have been ministerial and automatic functions that you know, uh, wouldn't have required an ounce of brain power. They somehow still made mistakes with them. Uh, you know, they needed to publish the time, date, and place of the hearing. Judge Walbaum had ordered them to do that. Um, in April, they didn't do it. You know, delay and delay and delay. We get to June 30th, they haven't done it. Um, and the judge wants to know why. And the government's representation was that the administrator or the administrator's office uh, had instructed them not to. Well, that's an ex parte communication with the ultimate arbiter of the final rule. That's the person who's going to actually decide, yes, these drugs should be criminalized. I'm going to, you know, institute schedule one controls on them. And the, the, the government's lawyers are talking to that office about how to not follow Judge Walbaum's order. I mean, and what a silly thing to have an ex parte communication about. I mean, if you're gonna break the rules of, I mean, lawyers are ethically prohibited, first and foremost, from having one-sided conversations with the with the trier of fact. The judge is not supposed to be having a chat with the prosecutor or with the plaintiff's attorney when the defense attorney is not in the room. You know, it, 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 to make sure everything's fair, we, we have to make sure everybody's all there. It doesn't always have to be on the record, but but both sides need to be participating in that. And none of the interested parties were a participant in that conversation between the government and the administrator or the administrator's office. We don't know a lot about who in the administrator's office actually made this communication, why it was done, 
I still for the life of me can't understand why they would have been instructed the way they were instructed. Uh, but, you know, that's a really troubling problem uh, that could have procedural weakness for them if they had actually prevailed on rulemaking. Um, things like that, you know, the late untimely production, um, submitting exhibits in, you know, exhibit number five, that has got, you know, 500 pages of documents in it and, you know, different uh, documents contained within the exhibit. Just lots of little things like that, that, you know, perhaps it was the DEA couldn't keep up with the pace that the judge had said either. I don't know. But um, I feel like those mistakes just kind of kept piling up on them and that that might have been a major contributing factor. Yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of a snowball of things. I think it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly one thing. Certainly the uh, what John mentioned, um, that was with the the instruction to not publish a notice. That, that was certainly one of many things. Um, look, we had a fantastic slate of witnesses, you know, with the, with you, Hamilton, Jason, you know, uh, was Adam, what's, what was his last name? Halberstadt. Halberstadt. Halberstadt he, he had fantastic testimony, Dr. Becker. You know, I, David Nutt, is anyone in the world more qualified than David Nutt on, you know, psychopharmacology? Um, Dr. Averill, there was the, you know, the declaration that we got from the Assistant Secretary of HHS during the Trump administration. It was kind of short, but it said, I wouldn't do this. <laughs> um, it, it, so um, there was that. And he said it wasn't a current evaluation. So then, and that again gets to my one of my, my strategies in this case was to focus on legal issues um, because evidentiary issues, the agency gets a lot of, you know, what does six rats do in Texas? The agency gets a lot of latitude. What does the actual law mean, like the statute, the Controlled Substances Act? Like they don't get so much latitude on that. So that was one of the things I focused on was the current. Um, and um, yeah, we, we, had, we had a bunch of really great testimony. What did they have? They had Dr. Carbonaro, who didn't say anything other than I adopt these eight factors as my own. You know, John wrote, really, at the very end, John wrote a really great motion. It's like, you know, what, she's talking about all of these like data forensic data reports where the, it's not even hearsay. It's like double hearsay or triple hearsay. It's like how many steps removed can you be? I mean, if this, I, it's not a criminal trial, so you don't have the same sort of standard of proof and constitutional rights, but like at a certain point, it's like, you know, I don't get to testify about a conversation you Hamilton had with John who had a conversation with someone else. It's like, at some point, like this person is not, qualified to testify. And they didn't, they, they, I'm not saying they didn't have anyone else. They weren't willing to bring anyone else, um, including the person whose email, like, I know who the person was, because that person he's listed as on the the one or two emails that they produced to us. Um, they weren't willing to bring that person. So, you know, when you add it all together, um, I think that, you know, the other person who should get credit is the person you mentioned is like Rick Doblin. And, and I, I, I say that, you know, Rick is confused as to why this happened. Well, this is this is at a weird moment in time, right? I mean, we had a lot of testimony, at least we put in about veterans and you know, Dr. Averill talked about like these veterans need these treatments. Um, and the idea, just the very political idea that they could be doing something that would basically set the veteran community back I mean, the administration's not very popular right now, and I just don't. So, so there's a political element to it, which, to the credit, honestly, goes to nobody involved in the proceedings and the people outside doing the work of of getting the veterans and sort of making the tie to psychedelics and veterans. So it's like it's kind of like I don't want to say everyone can claim the credit for it. I mean, that that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you know, there's probably something political going on too. That you know, at the end of the day, the DEA is subordinate to the attorney general who's subordinate to the, the president and the white house and everything. And I'm guessing there probably was some sort of discussion and they were just like, you know what, just, just tank it. And then the next question is I, I saw some people saying, okay, so they're just kicking the can to HHS. Then they're going to start this all over again. My feeling on this, and I could be completely wrong here is 
even if HHS wants nothing more than to create a persuasive case that these five tryptamines should be controlled, what are they going to do? The DEA already scraped to the bottom of the barrel with every imaginable piece of weak evidence they could collect. There's nothing else they're going to find. What else could possibly exist? The reality is that these are not substances of abuse. So if even if they assign a 200 person task force to collecting evidence that 5-MeO-DET is a drug of abuse, they're just not going to be able to dig that much up. I mean, am I being overly optimistic? Do you think HHS is going to come back with something and we're going to have to play this game all over again? Or do you think it's over? I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, if, 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 the only reason they sent this back was they didn't have a current evaluation and all they want is a current evaluation and then they will move forward. Then, you know, I guess the answer to your question is, well, they just have the same thing only instead of having 2012 at the top of it, it's got 2022. And so it's, it's current. And so they can move forward. I, I think it's going to be more involved in that. I think we did a good job of basically calling into question their entire case. And so there there's, there's more to do there. Um, you know, they could come back with one or more of the tryptamines, but not all five. I mean, again, like DIPT, like, you know, what the hell? Like, what, I mean, it, it, even if you were to take it, like, I'm still not convinced it's like even dangerous. I mean, you, you, you know better than me, but what it, your auditory pitch processing is like, I mean, first of all, I mean, do people do this for fun? Second, like, even if you were to do it, like, this is just not like a drug that I, think honestly like fits in with all the others so it's possible they were to come back with maybe one or two of the tryptamines if they're still convinced um i think a good example if, if you're looking for a historical example is ketamine um actually i'm about to write on write about this on my newsletter and the ketamine but you know ketamine is an interesting substance part of the reason why we have ketamine clinics is it wasn't put into schedule one because it was an anesthetic that was very useful in vietnam it's very useful as a military anesthetic and then is put in schedule three, which allowed experimentation with it. But interestingly, it wasn't even put into schedule three until 1999. Um, in the 80s, HHS was the one that wanted to put it into schedule uh, one, or not one, but they were recommending putting it in schedule three. And they said something to DEA saying, we want to put this into schedule three. And DEA said, but only like four people are using this a year, according to our data. So this is the 80s. Um, and they said, we're not going to do this. So DEA was the one to say, eh, I, don't, I don't think this is quite enough. So, I mean, again, contrast that to DIPT now, which was they had exactly four, four people a year. So at least in the 80s, four people a year wasn't enough. Um, so, but then what happened was, is it became more of a club drug and you had like special K and all that stuff. And in the 90s, they ended up moving forward a second time. And this second time around, they put on the schedule. So reason I bring that up is it's not unheard of for them to come back and do something and recollect the data and um, come to a different conclusion at some point in the future. Um, so that wouldn't shock me if that happened with one or more of the tryptamines. I mean, there is, I'm kind of, you know, it's possible. Um, but I mean, it should take a little bit at, at minimum, right? I mean, you guys are doing research, my guys are doing research, like, we get more time to do the research at minimum. Again, DIPT doesn't belong with the other four, so they should honestly treat it separately if they were to do anything like, but, um, but yeah, that's, I, I don't know, is, is that was a long lawyerly, I don't know. The, the only dark sided point of view I can imagine would be to look at how this started. I mean, web trip is a really unusual story. We're, we're talking about raids that are in part looking for legal substances, right? That's just a really unusual exercise of police power. And what it tells me is that they wanted to do this without any evidence, that they decided that they were going to manufacture the evidence. I mean, I'm not saying that they planted DIPT or any of these things in these labs. I'm saying that it's a very, strange law enforcement priority to be going in knowing that you're going to find legal chemicals. I mean, yes, they also needed to be sure that they were illegal chemicals so that they could say, well, you know, these are bad apples. These are drug dealers. And, you know, the, this, these legal substances are also intended for abuse. But 
I mean, they have, they hold all the cards. It would be very easy for them to generate that same kind of data uh, in 2022 as they did in 2002, 2003, 2006, uh, if they really want to. Um, and they, you know, maybe they will. I, I, I'm hopeful that they won't. I'm hopeful that they will understand that, you know, if nothing else, like you said at the beginning, where's the hospital data? Where's the medical examiner data? People aren't dying from this. People aren't having medical emergencies from it. So, I mean, they can, they can find all the clandestine drug labs in Boston or Philadelphia or anywhere that they want to, but people aren't being harmed by these substances. So I, I think that they may, may realize that it's a waste of their time. And, and that's what I'm praying for, but. But well, you know, what, what, one thing to note about the law, like the Controlled Substance Act, right, is it does say potential for abuse. And it, it's pretty clear that, that the, the government doesn't have to wait for a drug to become a problem before they move forward. Now, again, I still don't think it's inappropriate, except there was there is one chemical among the five um, and, and not to throw like field trip under the bus. But if I recall correctly, like 4-hydroxy dipti is like one of the I think it's maybe what one of two or three substances that Shulgin like rated as a plus four or potentially getting there. So, I mean, and, and I think you said something that doesn't match the speed and intensity of it. So, I mean, look, my clients, the one I, that they were researching was. Um, was was kind of like almost like a I don't want to say like diet MDMA, but it was like kind of you know nobody would confuse it for the Schedule One drugs. But I mean, you know, I, I think that if you did like a, if you did a careful evaluation and you you found a few human reports that kind of corroborated it, I mean, potential potential for abuse, right? Like, I mean, they get they get to decide what that means, and um, so you, they don't have to wait for. Um, for there to be significant hospital admissions. Now, the counterpoint to that, right, is that's why you have the emergency scheduling, right? Like, you know, in the event, like you don't have to put it on schedule one, you can just like, if, if it becomes a problem, then emergency schedule it, and then you have three years to do the evaluation. Um, but, you know, it gets back to what John was saying earlier of, there's just so much power in this that is given to the DEA and the, the attorney general. Um, and it's it's it is a little concerning right yeah and that's that leads to my final question about all this is we have the same issue repeating with doi and doc this was totally exhausting for me and jason and john we you know collectively spend hundreds of hours working on this without pay and it's tiring. This is not easy to do. And it's going to be really hard to repeat the success with DOI and DOC. And even if there is a success with that, the question is, how do we stop this game in the future? How do we prevent this stupidity from continuing? Because it is such a massive waste of resources and time, especially when Last year, there were more fatal overdoses than ever before in history, and none of them were associated with classical psychedelics. Well, I think one thing would be to, to signpost and telegraph to the DEA more than is already apparent from how much money is pouring into psychedelic research, um, that there's going to have to come a day where the scheduling determinations on the, the classical hallucinogens are, are reevaluated. Um, that's that's their that's their Alamo. That's their fallback position, right? I mean, the thing that those these discrimination studies are all trying to demonstrate is that all of these drugs that they're proposing to put on the schedule have uh, similar effects in lab rats to LSD, to MDMA, to DMT. Uh, when we say similar effects, they, they're may ostensibly making these rats hallucinate, or at least they think that they're making the rats hallucinate. And, and they've decided that that state of mind, that experience is something that the public should not have that is bad for the public. And that, that central first premise is 
uh, what's justifying all of these potential actions that that are popping up. Uh, but at the same time, we're at a point in history where there's so much new medical evidence coming out about the positive effects of these drugs. And that's going to have to change how the DEA interacts with and understands those drugs. And I think that that's the linchpin is to force the DEA to acquiesce that just because a rat substitutes some new chemical for LSD doesn't mean that there's a problem. Um, and then so I, you know, that, that seems like that's the frontier that needs to be explored more. I mean, obviously marijuana has, has had a terrible time of it. Um, you know, and the lawsuits and in federal court who have rightfully pointed out how bad faith the DEA has acted in reevaluating its schedule one status. Um, they've all demonstrated that it may be an impossible feat, but, uh, you know, that that's where the, in, that's the tower that has to be stormed. I, I, I almost pulled that one off, um, but not quite. I felt, I felt just short of the finish line on that one too. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that the marijuana issue is is kind of troubling. Um, yeah, I don't know. The DOI I think is is actually is just um it's really troubling. Now DOC is is interesting. Um and, and we're at the end, but that raises a whole bunch of interesting issues relating to like international drug treaties. Um, because what triggered that was I think it was like the UN mm -hmm. put DOC on like some treaty which causes like DA, like it basically forces them to do a schedule evaluation and scheduling evaluation. But, um, but of course, you know, the U S law is sovereign. Like we don't have to do what some other country is like telling us to do, but um, I don't know. I think, I think one sort of short-term thing is making sure that HHS is in the loop on these things. Right. Cause they, you know, I, I'm, Kind of like hot cold on the FDA. Like there, there's there are a lot of things about the FDA that that part of the administrative state I don't like. But you know, at the end of the day, they are more attuned as to what the scientific and research community needs. And if DA has to get the sign off from HHS on these things, um, that is at least at present the institutional check. And and you're hearing good rhetoric. You're hearing good words come out of like Nora Volkow at. National Institute of Drug Abuse saying like we need to research these psychedelics and everything. So I think the message is is at least resonating over on that that and it'll probably resonate there first, right? Because they're the ones looking at the research, the the IND app, field trips IND or whoever's studying whatever psychedelics are coming in. So I mean that that's kind of my hope short term. I mean long term, I mean you got to re-engineer the Controlled Substances Act. Like it just doesn't work. Yeah, I I hope that there is hope for that. I mean, this small success gives me hope. And I hope that all the people that are now involved will make the DEA think more carefully before doing this sort of thing frivolously in the future. But it's so hard to tell. Yeah. Any yeah, final just... notes? Keep... Uh... Keep watching the Federal Register. Don't let them sneak up on us. Yeah. So it was a pleasure going to war with you, gentlemen. Anytime. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I, I actually like you know this is not my. Uh, I guess I'm I'm doing more and more of this drug kind of policy regulatory litigation. I I think I've sued the DEA now eight times in the past year. I'm I'm now a plaintiff like myself on a lawsuit because they were stiffing they are stiffing my freedom for of information act requests so it's kind of like a sideshow in, in some sense but like because we weren't able to get certain documents in the the proceeding i was like foying like on my own like hey i'd like you know a poster uh and they wouldn't give me they wouldn't give us a poster um so i've got my own lawsuit but um no it was it was, it was great um it was great going to war with you gentlemen um and and it what, what was particularly great about it right was what Hamilton, what you said earlier, just like there weren't that many people willing to stand up. So, um, you know, uh, it was good not being us not being alone, that there was just, you know, that this was because, you know, when you're one person, right, it's like, oh, we've got that crazy dissenter. But when there's more than one person standing up there, it actually looks a lot better. So it really was a pleasure. Likewise. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both. And uh, I'm going to post this probably tomorrow. And 
thank you for doing the interview and thank you for working on this. Congratulations to both of you for the success. You too, Hamilton. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.